Today, ladies and gentlemen, this is Watson Michael from Silan Institute of English and Leadership. And today, let me say once again, we are honored to have Mr. Sean Kidney back with us, who is the CEO and co-founder of Climate Bonds Initiative. Also, he's a professor in practice at SOS University, London, and he serves on several other boards as well. Sean, welcome back. And how are you doing today? Hey, Watson. Thanks for having me back. I'm great, thanks. Great. So, uh, now this year, May, okay, was supposed to be the 12th consecutive month with record high temperatures. And last year, droughts in Panama caused some shipping companies to send, spend millions on, uh, to avoid the queues. So we're already facing climate-related challenges. What are your views on that? Well, look, I actually want to start off with some good news. Mm. Because okay. from what we can see at the moment, the work we've done in the last 15 years has made an impact. The current consensus mm -hmm. amongst climate scientists is, the, is that we have managed to reduce the likely warming by one degree Celsius. It's actually a win. Wow. We've been turning wow. down the curve or turning or reducing the, the, the growth. So we have actually been making progress. And this is written up in a project called the Inevitable Policy Response that we're a part of. You can search that online, which shows mm -hmm. the likely development around yeah. climate policies and outcomes based on the changes that have already made. And most countries now have yes. active climate policies, especially the larger nations that are responsible for emissions reduction. So we're actually mm. making progress. And, you know, in the US, we've seen the IRA in Japan, we've got the Green Transformation Plan. In Europe, there's in Reinvest EU. And China, in the last year, invested 239 gigawatts in wow. renewable energy. That is like a lot of power. It's about 45% of global new electricity. And by the way, 90% of all electricity generation investment on the planet two years ago, even if I haven't got, haven't got last year's figures yet, was clean energy. So it's kind of, you know, wow. on the energy side, we're making fast progress. Um, the impact of all of this has been that emissions have turned down. Uh, well, no, sorry, let me rephrase that. The curve has flattened a bit. We're still on a pathway to severe climate change, but it looks mm. like we're off the pathway to catastrophic climate change. It changes all my speeches. Mm. Yeah. So, and, you know, and so we need to celebrate that. But, you know, let's be clear. It's not a game over. It is very line ball. There's all these things we don't know about, feedback loops in the global climate system, et cetera. So, we have to get emissions down. At the moment, the best trajectory is that we will get emissions to stop at 1.8 degrees warming. And mm -hmm. then we'll have a shot at reducing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And through that, start cooling the planet a bit. So that's kind of what we're working towards. There is still a chance yeah. that emissions will go to 2.5 or 3 degrees if mm -hmm. we don't follow through on the policy initiatives have been started. If Donald Trump gets elected, for example, if the European Union gets taken over by Marine Le Pen, et cetera, you get the idea. Yeah. So there's a lot of risk involved in the system. But, you know, it is important to note that we've actually had an impact globally. Now, that impact, of course, is highly concentrated in China, in mm -hmm. the US, in Europe, and in India, as the countries that are now Japan, that have moved so aggressively for change. So it's, mm. uh, it, you know, it's, it hasn't necessarily changed things in Sri Lanka. Um, there are other issues that are being addressed in Sri Lanka. And in fact, renewable energy growth in Sri yeah. Lanka, as we talked about, is way, way behind the rest of the world, even though mm. it's uh, the low cost. But you've got to have the capital to be able to install new solar plants. And that's a bit of a challenge in Sri Lanka at the moment. So we'll, we'll get there yeah. eventually. <clears throat> so there is progress going forward. However, where we've got to globally, is that 
we will overreach the 1.5 degree maximum temperature rise mm -hmm. the G20 and the IPCC talk about. That does mean that significant climate impacts are now baked into the system. It does mean that we're going to get civil rise and storm surges on the Colombo seafront. It does mm. mean that we don't know how bad that's going to be and we need to prepare. We can't prepare exactly, I say raising the boardwalk at the beaches of, of Colombo, because we don't know whether it's going to be half a metre or four metres. It's actually very uncertain. You know, at the moment, there's a lot of science coming through about the accelerated melting in the West Antarctic ice shelf. If it's as bad as some of these reports are saying, you know, we could see two to three metres sea level rise by 2050. And that wipes out the entire uh, ocean front at Colombo. It's gone. Mm. So, you know, these are uncertainties. The main thing is we've got to start preparing to be resilient. We have to assume now that floods are going to become normal. You know, to take a game at Colombo Waterfront just because I've been there when I was yeah. younger and you're there. Uh, it may not yeah. be that sea level rises go up three metres. One thing you'll be sure is storms are going to get bigger. So there will be floods mm. that will recede. So resilience means building cities so they can be flooded and they can get working again the next morning when the waters recede. What does that mean? Well, we kind of know there's all science of this sort of stuff that we haven't actually applied to our cities. So building resilience, heat resilience. We're going to get much higher temperatures going forward. This year in India and in Uttar Pradesh, mm. we've seen the highest ever temperatures recorded in India, 54 degrees, yeah. I think it was. And the, already the mortality rate amongst older people is way high. Is really, you know, people are dying from heat already. That's going to become worse uh, quite quickly. And that's not just in India. It's also in Spain. It's in southern USA. It's in southern Brazil this year, where they had a week mm. of 50 degrees Celsius heat, 52, I think it was in Rio de Janeiro at one point. All those people live in the slums, like in so many parts of Sri Lanka and India as well as Brazil and, and Peru. They cannot escape. There's nothing they can do. And you can't, you know, if you're living in a favela, which is a tin roof, then it's not, there's no cooling. You know, you just, it, and that's when people die, especially older people mm -hmm. and, young, and, and young people. And that's, um, that's the world we're going into. We've got to get ready. So we have to do a few things mm -hmm. in a hurry to be able to survive this. Even though we're making progress, nowhere near enough progress to avoid this catastrophe. We've got to make sure that people have money to be able to recover from the floods and the storms that are now going to become the norm and the droughts in between the floods. Now, everything is going to go volatile. You know, even in London, there's going to be lump, big dumps of rain. There's going to be no rain for a year. This is very, a very different climate that we're going into. And there's going to be big heat mm -hmm. in the middle of that period and uh, other extremes of various sorts. So what does that mean? Well, it yeah. means, for example, you know, a, a small businesswoman in, in Sri Lanka probably needs to have a rainy day fund or access to micro insurance. There's a scheme in the Philippines where a cooperative insurance company offers micro catastrophe insurance for a, for a tiny stipend. And if there's an extreme typhoon, everyone automatically gets a hundred dollar payout. It's only a hundred dollars, but it makes it the mm. whole difference to a small family being able to get back on its feet again. These are one of the things we need to build. We need to ensure our cities have refuges from the heat. Probably means putting the shopping malls underground where there's natural yeah. insulation. So people can go there if things get too bad outside. We need to make sure, by the way, that our electricity grid is hardened. Because if you get a week of 50 degree heat in Colombo, and with that humidity, people will start dying from what's called wet bulb mm -hmm. temperature when you can't perspire anymore. You need places where the air conditioning can be on like the mall, but you need the power to keep working. Mm -hmm. And the power often fails in those extreme circumstances. So that's a whole grid management system, you know, and so on and so on. And But above all, we need the citizens of Sri Lanka to be wealthier because they've got more chance then of surviving volatility. Mm -hmm. you know, the poorer mm -hmm. we are and the more unequal our societies are, the more vulnerable we are. Greater equality in a society is a predictor of resilience and recovery. So mm. the agenda's big. The agenda's big, what we've got to do. And that's even after we've made progress on getting emissions down globally. 
Hey, what's the what's wow. to do? Absolutely, Sean. Sure. I just, I mean, like the way you explained, I would say the way you articulated. I mean, so much knowledge in a few sentences. I don't know how it happens, but you just give a entire masterclass in a few sentences, right? Pretty impressed. Okay, right. So, um, th thanks a lot. I mean, for ex uh, explaining about the heat waves and like. Um, like we don't know about the weather conditions as well, right? What will happen? So now recently, I saw Climate Bonds did some great work in Brazil, right? And on LinkedIn also, I saw a lot of interesting posts. Could you uh, elaborate more, more on that? Sure. We've got a whole program in Brazil, a dozen staff. And we work with the Ministry of Infrastructure, Ministry of Agriculture on climate consistent investments. That wrote them. We work at the Central Bank too around how they can um, mm. encourage um, green investments in agriculture, which they see as an indicator of resilience in the agricultural system. Um, we've signed an MOU in Brazil with the ICLE, the International Association of, of uh, Municipalities. Um, uh, we've, um, we're promoting capital flows between China and Brazil at the moment, because Brazil has three mm. large trading partners, Europe, USA, and China. Um, okay. And they're buying a lot of solar cells in China. Well, you know, on the agricultural, we've been behind a couple of China-Brazil investment summits. And this is all about green, sustainable investment, right? Avoided deforestation, mm. all these sorts of things. But also, we're promoting the issuance of green panda bonds, where a Brazilian company will issue a bond in China, which is very low interest rates at the moment, 2%, 2 to mm -hmm. 3%. Um, to be able to pay off the solar cell companies in China that they're buying kit from in Chinese yuan yeah. without having to do currency transfer and saves costs yeah. all around. So there's all sorts of things that we're doing in Brazil. But we also have programs yeah. in India, in China, in Japan, in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, wow. as well as in Colombia and places like that. So. Uh, there's there's yeah. there's work different kinds of work going on all around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, what's really exciting, what's really exciting is the extent to which now organizations and people in across the world are now starting to work. There is no doubt now, anywhere I go, mm. you know, apart from say Texas, <laughs> where there's still lunatics <laughs> in charge, um, there's no doubt that the world has started changing. And it's a question simply of how we're gonna make this work. Everywhere I go, how are we gonna make this work? I was at the International Monetary Fund spring meetings in Washington, D.C. a few weeks ago. It's become a climate meeting. And everyone, ministers of finance around the world, are talking about how we can get the finance we need to be able to meet the challenges of, I talked about earlier, climate mitigation, getting, you know, changing energy systems, auto systems, dealing with resilience, urban development, and, and social and uh, jobs and economic development that will position people to be able to survive climate impacts so that's mm -hmm. you know it's a it's a it's a very different world to five years ago in terms of the nature of discussion now which which makes it very optimistic for the future wow wow it's pretty insightful right so uh uh, how does a green bond work? The green bond is simply a loan. So, you know, let's say you want to um, uh, buy a new two-wheeler and you need to go to your aunt to borrow the money. Mm. And your aunt says, yeah, I'm happy to lend you money for a two-wheeler, but can you buy an electric one, not a petrol one? I mean, it's less noise. And it doesn't pollute, and it's better for the environment. You say, and you say, Auntie, of course, I really want to buy an electric one, and I promise I'll do it. And it's a green bond. And then, you yeah. know what I'll also do? I'll I'll come back every year. I'll make sure every Christmas we go for a ride together, so you can show you how cool it is. That's the reporting obligation mm -hmm. of a green bond. Yeah, pretty simple, really. That's all it is. You're borrowing money wow. for green stuff, and you're promising. The day you're going to do what you say you're going to do, and you'll show some evidence about it. Hey, 
very simple idea. Now, you've got to be able to borrow, right? So if the auntie doesn't trust you, you know, Watson, you didn't pay back that loan to me last year. Oh, I don't know. I'm not going to, I don't think I should give you more money at the moment. Yeah, it's going to be a problem, right? And we've got a bit of that in Sri Lanka at the moment, as you'd know. That's why the IMF is floating mm-hmm. around. Um, so we've got to build confidence on the part of the investors, your auntie, that you're going to pay back the money. That's clear, right? There's lots of ways you can do that. Like you could say, you know, auntie, I, I, I blew it last year because the the motorbike I, I bought had an accident and I wasn't able to pay you back. But this year, I've got my uncle who says that he will promise to pay back the loan if, if I get into trouble. Is that okay? And the auntie says, oh, that's okay. That sounds better. So in this case, your uncle will be the Asian Development Bank. We'll mm. provide a guarantee for or the or the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, actually. They provided a green bond guarantee for the government of Egypt. Wow. Who, rec- who, who uh, late last year issued a green bond to finance a lot of green stuff in Egypt because they're, they're, they've got the IMF in there as well. Um, they couldn't mm. get investors to be willing to invest on their own right. Mm. So they got their uncle, in this case, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, to kick the tires, do the assessment, and then provide a guarantee that if some if Egypt messed it up, AIB would step in. So AIB takes on the risk, right? They've got to assess and they've got to build confidence and so on. But that's how mm. Egypt managed to borrow a few billion dollars. Uh, this is an option wow. open to Sri Lanka. It's exactly the same as asking you out here for money, but you've got another article who's going to be a guarantor. He's not expecting to ever have to pay the money out, by the way. He's going to be coming on your door every week and saying, Watson, you've sorted this out, haven't you? Because he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to pay out the money. But if worse comes to worse, he'll step in. Everyone needs an article like that, right? <laughs> mm, absolutely right so yeah talking about my uncle and aunt right i used to remember my my uncle a long time ago he used to give me a few bucks okay to buy certain things all right <laughs> right there you, go. you know so you know what a green bond is <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I mean, the green part is just what qualifies as green and that's wow. about channeling the science so we've got to listen to our scientists. We've been ignoring them for a long time. That's why we're in this mess we're in globally. Mm, and we've been doing cool. that through three things called taxonomies, which are shopping lists of what qualifies. So mm. Europe has one, China has one, India has one, Indonesia has one, etc. Actually, the Sri Lanka Central Bank has one. We worked with them on that mm. a couple of years ago. So the wow. guidance about qualifiers of the green is there. And for investors, they have comfort in knowing that there have been scientists involved. It's proper work. It's not just the mm-hmm. opinion of a politician that's made it green. Yeah. And that's, that's a whole, so there's a whole apparatus that sits behind the green bond market. Wow. Fantastic. Okay. You just made it look so easy. Great. So, yeah. So I found an insightful uh, document actually and it came on because i had subscribed to cbi I, I, I was able to download it as well so it's a transition in action right so what would you just uh, brief us about it sorry what did you cut out then uh, tell me the name of the document again yeah. transition in action agri-food so uh, you know uh, in a lot of countries the biggest source of emissions is land use, agriculture. I mean, mm. deep, avoid deforestation, but you know, it's also agriculture. We need to be looking at how we change agriculture. Mm. So we've been providing guidance around that, and it's about transitioning agriculture to becoming low carbon and resilient mm. because the mm. world is changing. Droughts, floods, mean different kinds of agriculture has got to be. You know, places you've managed to grow maize, in Mexico in the past, mm-hmm. you won't be able to grow maize anymore. But we've got to plan for that and think ahead and, and so on. Um, so the guidance we've developed so far is around crops and livestock. So in many countries, there's a lot of meat eating, Latin America in particular, for example. Um, mm-hmm. Has that got to change? Well, one thing is to make sure that we're not chopping down trees to grow more cattle. Mm-hmm. So there's an avoided mm-hmm. deforestation label, which is another one, which is used by people like Unilever and Nestle to prove that the particular product they're selling has managed to incorporate principles of avoided deforestation, mm. not buying from people chopping down trees, essentially. Yeah. 
so supply chain checking and so on. The, they're, they're, we're working on alternative protein at the moment too, by the way, which is um, how, you, how you create protein through plant-based instruments or artificial mm. farming of, of lab meat. Because one, you know, Singapore, mm. to take an example, has a target, it's a city state, has a target of 30% of all the food eaten in Singapore will be grown in Singapore by 2030. Wow. And that's not going to be good for Malaysia and Indonesia who export food to Singapore. But they <laughs> want to do it for security yeah. reasons because they know yeah. that Malaysia and Indonesia could chop off, cut trade any moment if they get angry with Singapore. And it's happened before. So they've already done the world's best water system. If you go into a corner shop in Singapore, to buy a bottle of water, mm. you're buying a bottle of water that has come straight out of the waste stream. It might have gone through the waste stream seven times before it gets to a bottle to you. Mm. So, you know, it's all the poo and all the wee and everything else. They, yeah. they recycle everything and they recycle it to incredible purity. Wow. Uh, and and that, that avoids them having to pipe in water from Malaysia and risking Malaysia chopping off the pipes, they get angry at them. Now, this mm. is actually going to be the, the norm everywhere, because in a world of drought, flood, drought, flood, mm. everyone's got to be more careful about their water and manage it. So oh. Colombo needs to upgrade its water systems over mm. the next few years, A, to manage waste better, because you know at the moment, a lot of that waste is going to the ocean, and the ocean's becoming unsuitable in large parts of, of Colombo. But all, uh, we want to be clean, right? We, we need to be able to swim in it to get cool. But also yeah. because we've got to ensure that in times of crisis, we'll still have clean water. So what mm. does that look? So there's a couple of investment. That's a great bond, by the way, to, in, to do that in due course. And the Asian Development Bank would probably provide a guarantee for that, even with the IMF dealing with the government. So there's things we can do here, of necessary mm. investments to make Colombo greener going forward. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of these sort of things that need to be done. So Sri Lanka is doing a food, doing water, and a few other things, including, by the way, raising the height of its ports. It's uh, it's wharves, I should say, to uh, six meters to deal with climate change, increased sea levels, et cetera, et cetera. And so every yeah. country can can learn from that. On the food stuff, um, there's a lot of other areas we've still got to look at. We do need to look at um, tools to make farmers more resilient. You know, for example, mm. there are a few companies now that are offering satellite monitoring mm. of crops. So if you're doing, well, um, it probably doesn't affect the, the tea plantation so much, but lowland crops, you know, if, if there's drought, flood, drought, flood, and so on, you want to make sure you're planting the right crop to be able to make a living this year, especially if you're in a temperate climate like Punjab or whatever. Um, Satellite monitoring and predictive capability can tell you what the right crop to plan for this year is. And wow. this is what they're doing. So under these artificial intelligence models, which are now you can get on a smartphone, you get to deal with a smartphone, you're, you can subscribe to a service for pennies, which will tell you what crop to plant and how, because it's predictive modeling about what the land is looking like. These satellites look at soil moisture content, nutrient content, mm -hmm. uh, mi minerals content, everything, and they make deductive predictions as a result. And it's linked to an insurance product. So if your crop still fails, despite following the advice, and they can tell because the satellite is monitoring, then you get an instant insurance payout. Mm. Ooh. Now, this is a way to help small farmers because they're always having to do boom and bust and boom and bust, right? So this yeah. evens out everything. So, you know, all these sort of things are coming through in the agriculture space. There's a huge land use and agriculture agenda, not to mention promoting reduced use of pesticides, mm -hmm. more organic fertilizers rather than a mechanical or fertilizer made from gas and so on, which we have a, in Sri Lanka, we have a lot of opportunities to do. And of course we have to in Sri Lanka, because our mm. current account deficit meant that we were at one point stopped being able to import fertilizer. We didn't have the money to pay yeah. for it. So we need to shift to organic things, et cetera, et cetera. You get the idea. A lot to be done there. Wow. Absolutely. A lot more work needs to be done.
Yeah, very insightful. Okay, like it's like a several master classes you have broken it down. Okay, right. So uh, great. So Sean, we uh, thank you so much, right, for taking time and doing this podcast with us. Any final message from your side? Well, well you were listening. A, a lot of what we're doing is trying to translate, or rather, uh, link the capital markets to the farmer or the small home uh, owner or the small business owner, right? And that means intermediary institutions. So we work a lot with banks. So what we're mm. trying to encourage banks to do is to do lending, which also addresses climate, on the basis mm. they'll be able to raise bonds in the global markets or, in the, or the local markets preferentially at low interest rates mm. or more investors or whatever. But they've got to have the program. They've got to have the loan officer in Candy making a loan to someone which qualifies so there are systems involved. So, you know, I, mm. I, I don't mean to say that the debt market is going to be relevant to individual farmers directly. It's going to be through mm. a process. We still need that supply chain of money, yeah. if you like, that goes through, which is the job. So we've got to educate loan officers in, in banks. It requires management to commit to things. It requires our central bank to push them around a bit. To say, you've got to be doing this sort of stuff because it's going to be lower default risk for Sri Lanka going mm. forward. So there's a kind of world of work to make the engine out of the hood of the car work efficiently. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. for a farmer or a small business owner, they just have access to small loans, microfinance loans or whatever, which can make a difference to their lives, including making their activities more sustainable for environmental, but you know, for them, it's got to be more money, right? They're going to do something which right. is environment, but if it makes them more money, so making more money is cheaper loan and better returns. And we've got to always make that argument about how this, yeah. in the context of the stuff that's happening in the climate, is going to be a better way to earn a living. And that's that's the essence of it. And that's, that's challenging, but that is the discipline that we have to bring to this whole market. If we don't make it work that way, it's not going to work. There's no going to be lecturing about you shouldn't do that. That's a pile of rubbish. Mm. It's got to work for ordinary citizens, but it will work for ordinary citizens because the world is changing. And this is all mm. about alerting them in advance of how the world is changing so they can take advantage of it. Absolutely. So Sean, thank you very much for explaining all this to us. And of course, we'll be sharing the link free resources from Climate Bonds Initiative and you should have a look at their website. There's so much information and they do certain training programs as well, right? So for NGOs and different other entities. So Sean, thank you so much. Thank you, Watson. Thank you for having me today and good luck at the show, the podcast. Thank you very much.